we are going to be moving on together very well. Um, to start us off today, I had not um, assigned anybody to do the prayers, so I would like to invite anyone who would be willing to start us off with a prayer. Yes, Edward, please may you go ahead. Let us, are you getting me? Are you getting me? Yes, we are getting you. Please go ahead with the prayer. Let us pray. Lord of mercy, the creator of heaven and earth, we come before thee this morning. We thank you for the protection and love you offer to us. Now we have gathered in our third week for our workshop on how we should take care of the environment which you give to us as our responsibility. Be with us, guide the SAFSA team and all members are available here. Brace us with knowledge so how, on how to take care of the environment. Guide us through up to the end and be with us so that we should remember what we have learned from this workshop and we should apply it into our various places. Be with our presenters today so that we should be spread more deal on this program. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Edward, for the prayer and uh, putting our presenters before the Almighty. Um, today, we are going to be looking at the topic that centers on soil and soil management. And this proceeds from the past two um, sections where we were dealing with, first of all, defining and clarifying what our sustainable consumption is. And the second one where we dealt with the issues that surrounded um, seeds. Now that we have the knowledge of sustainable production, we have the knowledge of the seeds. Where are we going to be planting the seeds? This is maybe the question that we will be looking at. And um, so the objective for the day today is for us to learn how to manage the soil. So at the end of this, all of us should be in a position to be able to properly manage the, the soil and actually work on it so that it is better able to help us in terms of production. And the rest, I think we are going to be getting from there. Um, before we start, I would also want to find out from all of us if there is anybody amongst us who has something burning that they would want to share, would then let's make use of the um, chat box so that we can all, all not also disrupt the proceedings. Um, and last time out, we had some people who were having problems with uh, muting. Let's all try and mute so that we are able to hear and not have disruptions at all. And for those who may have other colleagues who may want to join, please don't share your link, but you may share with them that they can actually view this whole program on Facebook as well. So as we are on this particular program, it is also being streamed live on our Facebook. So they may also be able to follow it on that channel. So thank you very much, everybody. and. Um, would want to take up today's um, proceedings. And I do believe that we will be able to learn a lot more. And for colleagues who are in Malawi, um, our presenter is um, actually in Malawi at the moment. And um, I know he has some colleagues that have managed to join them and they will be on this platform together. So we do welcome um, John and all those that are with him as well. And I would also want to acknowledge the presence of um, 
two colleagues who are on this call, at Low as well as Numisa, who are going to be helping us a lot in terms of how this meeting is going to proceed. I would also want to welcome those two to this particular program. If you have any other questions that are administrative, you can direct um, them even through the chat directly to either Numisa or Klo or myself. Thank you very much. Um, Klo, can we take it up from there in terms of uh, the presentation for today from Mr. John Zira? Hello, Tlo. Hi, Gabriel. I will share just now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, today it's our uh, third webinar on ensure sustainable consumption and the production food system. Uh, we are going to focus on soil management and within soil management, we are going to look at uh, building soil, soil health, soil conservation, biofertilizers, and maintenance of the land. On maintenance, we are going to talk more about mulching and ground covers. So basically, um, when we talk about soil, maybe we need to have a little bit of a background. So we know that uh, uh, soil is the, our natural resource but we have a challenge that we export soil to the ocean through water and we have so much erosion in our communities it's because we are not managing our land and the way we use uh, we practice farming or the way we farm it also uh, exacerbates the loss of soil within our communities and there is no doubt that the Southern African region as a, as a whole is faced with serious land degradation, in particular soil erosion and fertility. This is why uh, sometimes people, they go back to look at uh, uh, using synthetic fertilizers. And when they use synthetic fertilizer as well, it exacerbates the uh, infertility of the soil at a long run. And also it exacerbates the soil erosion in the, uh, in the communities or in the Arab lands. The ecosystems have already been destroyed and replaced with the artificial agriculture systems. This is what we were talking about in the last uh, webinar that we lost our identity, we lost uh, our uh, indigenous species because of agriculture. Uh, because of the naked agriculture where you remove everything on the land and you cultivate. As you see on the left uh, photograph, it shows us that uh, some of the homesteads that where we live, we are living in a desert. But all these deserts, they are created by us. And if you look at uh, the right photograph, you see this is the formal plowing. See how much dust is being ero eroded by wind. And where is it going? It's going to be deposited somewhere uh, into, another, into another area. So most of uh, the dust is rich in silt and rich with the, in humus. And that's the nutrients that are going. And it's part of the erosion that is taking place in our parts. And uh, we need to look at uh, how we can manage this. By managing this, we need to look and understand uh, the nat natural order. Uh, if we have the knowledge and we know the natural orders of the soil, then we are able to take care of the soil. But because sometimes 
we might know it and ignore and bring synthetic chemicals or fertilizer into the soil. Then that causes much damages. So we need to know what are the mineral deficiencies in the soil or any environmental factors of the soil. Like you need to do soil testing, soil analysis. You can do it on farm. Uh, don't need chemicals to do that. You don't need uh, special scientists to do that. A small older farmer is a scientist by nature. So you can analyze or they can analyze the soils that they are farming. And you need to analyze also how much soil disturbance on your farm. What happens when you receive rain? What happens when you walk in the in the field in the in your farm? Do you see small gullies? Uh, do you see soil eroded? Do you see soil deposited uh, somewhere? Uh, do you see the roots of the plants? And when you start seeing that, you start saying something is wrong in your farm. Because once you see soil, naked soil exposed to sunlight, it means that you are killing lots of insects that live in the soil and fungus, viruses, bacteria, and other soil life. And when uh, you do not have fungus, then you do not have the, uh, a support to, to the microorganisms that, that live in the soil. So we need the mycelium from the fungus that help in networking the microbes in the soil and provide the food that the plants require. And as you see to your right side, the photograph soil, the soil food web. Once we do not have these minerals, uh, these animals and the organic matter in the soil, then we do not have a good or health soil in our environment or in the park. So basically, we are saying uh, that uh, when you look at the soil, check the effectiveness of mineral cycles. Is the minerals in the, co in the farm effectively uh, circulate within the soil or within the farm, or it's being eroded away? And as you know, there is uh, uh, the sunlight which provides photosynthesis to the green plants, makes food, in the plant and the leaves fall down. When they fall down, uh, they decompose and provide food for living organisms. Animals, they eat the grass, they later give us uh, manure, and that manure is decomposed, it's pushed into the ground. That uh, mixing of uh, uh, organic matter or manure uh, to the soil, it is usually happening naturally. And when it happens naturally, it is the nature helping itself to feed the microbes in the soil. And when you see a pool of an animal sitting on the surface of the land for a week without being decomposed or being decomposed, or it means that there are less microorganism organisms like uh, dung beetles who can take this organic matter, push it into the ground. And once you push it to the ground, after rain, the water follows those uh, tunnels that she, she creates. And then other plants can send the seed there. And then the plants can easily grow. And nature helps itself to make sure that it repairs the environment that we damage. So when we look at soil, there is the, what you call dead soil and live soil. And the dead soil, it's a when uh, there is poor crop production and production is very low, less microorganism. If you dig the soil, you hold it in hands, in your hands, then you find no microorganism in it. It all means that there is no uh, good, it's not a good soil. And low nutrients, find that there are, there is very poor nutrients in the soil. It all means that uh, the soil is not managed well. Just want to show you one bottle of nutrients. As we talk, we need, I need to show you uh, something uh, that we have that our students have done here on the farm last week when we had the workshop. 
So as we discussed, the poor soul or dead soul is the, the one that when you 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 uh, walk on it, it forms dust, and usually most of the time it's bare. So if you have a soul that is not covered, it's a dead soil. Uh, when the rain comes in, uh, the waters take nets, and then it shows that the the soils are not good. Then good soil or life soil. Because soil, good soil, it's life. When you say it's life, it has living organisms. And these living organisms, they help in uh, activating the soil, making sure the soil provides uh, the food that they plant require. So the nutrients, uh, the soil that is good, it has lots of nutrients. And uh, how do we see that? We see that by dark in color. For example, For example, you can see this soil. We have uh, done an experiment with uh, students, and you can see there's layers. And you can see the top layer here is sealed. It's lots of humus, organic matter. And if you see this one, the white uh, like white line, it's clay. And this one, it's a uh, uh, humus soil. It has a little bit of scent. So if you grow something in this type of soil, it can give you good, better yield and that it holds water. It is the soil uh, that is high in organic matter, and it is the soil with lots of uh, microorganisms, and soil with moisture. And this soil usually, uh, it uh, is able to allow water to move through down to the, to the, to the, to the water table. This is the type of soil that we have in our garden. And that's why we are able to grow any crop in our garden because the soil we have here is good. It's health soil. It's live soil. What kind of soil do we have at home? Is it dead or alive? So when we do this, how do we go about building health soil? Uh, we can build health soil. You can see on my right here, there is a um, a small garden, and when we started this garden, the soil was too there, too uh, neglected, dead. But we built it, and we have good spinach, good um, rocket, wide variety of vegetables. But you can see on the pathway, it's emulsed. So the whole idea is to build the health soil, and the health soil provide good nutrients for. Uh, for the plants. It also builds plants to grow so that they resist against pests and diseases. And as you see my vegetables here, they are not uh, attacked by pests. They are so healthy. And even if you visit today in my farm, you'll find that there are no insects that are attacking or serious insects that are attacking our crops because the way we do it and because of uh, the nutrients that we give to the plants. We always care for the soil because it helps in the protection of uh, lots of uh, or mi millions of uh, soil creatures, the uh, microorganisms. So when you are farming, dig less so that you do not allow the soil to kill microorganisms in the that are in the soil. That is also after digging, after planting. Uh, mulch more to save moisture and the apply organic matter. The mulch itself is an organic matter, so it will uh, decompose back and give you nutrients. I'll explain uh, further about the uh, uh, mulch. So mulch also provides a fertilizer for a sustainable soil fertility. It's a way of creating sustainable uh, nutrients to the to the soil. So when you want to start, uh, it can be a garden or a small garden, it is important that you consider or check, you have a checklist in your, on your farm. If you have uh, compost making activities, if you have earthworm farming, 
vermiculture, we call it vermiculture. If we have liquid manure that's uh, fermented the uh, animal manure, uh, then if you have your are practicing station uh, planting uh, to dig a small pit and uh, feed the pit with organic matter, if you are practicing alley system, alley system can be done in a commercial way. You can practice this in 10 hectares, 100 hectares. Uh, alley system is part of the polyculture system. So the polyculture, it is a system that you bring different species together. But you do not bring them in a haphazard way or chaotic way. You need to bring them in an order way so that each plant or each row is talking to each other or is supporting the system of farming uh, for better production. You can develop beds in your field like uh, standard beds, the ordinary beds that we say 1.2 by width and the length can be two meters or four meters. And these are the standard beds that we talk about where you can grow your vegetables. But also you can do rich beds where in a big farm can be in a hectare, you make rows in a rich form where you plant on the ridge. And when you plant on the ridge, you sort of concentrate nutrients on the ridge. Then when you harvest the crops, you take back the stovers or the maize residue or crop residue. You put them into the basin of the ridges and then close them there. Then they provide good manure for compost for the future crop or the crops that you plant in the next season. Mulching is the blanket of the soil. It is a means to make sure that uh, moisture is maintained. It is a means that to make sure that soil is not left naked. Pit beds, it's a system where you can make small pits in the garden and fill it with organic matter, kitchen waste, and all other things that can decompose. You can also put um, uh, wood ash into the pits and they help in the providing the nutrients that are required by the plants. Green manure, green manure, uh, it's a way of growing crops and they come to a certain height or certain level of growth. Just before they flower, you cut them back and then they become manure for the crops. And this is a way that you can do at a small garden or in a commercial garden, commercial farm. Trench bed, trench bed is also a way of collecting all the waste, waste that you can find within the homestead. We are talking of tins, uh, bones, uh, wood ash, old blankets, old shirts, old t-shirts, old the clothes. You pile it into the trench and you close. You add a manure in it and then they decompose and they hold soil in there. You plant tomatoes on top and then the tomatoes will send the roots into that food zone and then they can grow happily and provide you with nice tomatoes. Sheet mulching is a way of growing, uh, of, of preparing a bed. It is, um, in some local language, they call it umbe dauma villa. Those who are lazy can uh, practice sheet mulching. It's a way of taking cut boxes. You take uh, manure or compost, or you take uh, uh, mulch like uh, uh, dry grass, you put in layers, starting with a uh, bit of uh, cut box and then manure and then, um, and then your mulch. This one, it is a bed where you don't need to dig. You just put this cut box and paper together and then at the edge of it, you mound it, you shape it to make sure that the grass cannot come through in there or cannot grow out from the bed, uh, and then you control the weeds. And then you plant on top, you have food from, uh, from west. 
So when we talk about, and now I'm going to give you a few examples of what I've mentioned earlier. Uh, they are not in order. I'll just provide them as we go. One is alley cropping. Alley cropping, uh, it is, you can see, the main in this, the main crop here is the avocado. This is an avocado, and this is a line of avocado. But you plant it in a way that uh, you leave wider space. So if, for example, eight meters between the lines is recommended, make it about 10 meters between the rows. So when you have that, then plant lucerne. This is lucerne. Then as the avocado grows, the lucerne is in between. You can bring your cattle, your animals, livestock, and graze in there. Or you can cut this and provide it to livestock whilst the avocados are providing food for you. So, and when you have this, you do not have any uh, wheat because the lucerne will cover the ground. Eventually also the lucerne, it's a nitrogen fixer, so it will provide nutrients to the soil. And also uh, the leaves, when you cut them back, they can also be used underneath the avocado trees and then they can kill nematodes and other diseases that can uh, try to attack the... But the main aim here is to make sure the soil is rich. So this is what we are trying to do. So the lucerne will provide lots of nutrients into the, into the soil. If you look on this other side, you can do the alley cropping with crops, uh, like first row here was maize, and this row had beans, but the beans has been harvested. After harvesting beans, we cover the ground with mulch. And then we have the uh, nuts. Also, they are still in the field, but we we'll harvest them, and then they can the, the leaves can be used as uh, as mulch as well. Then after we have sunflower, and we have other crops. So this is a means of growing crops in in rows. But you take like a nuts, ground nuts or peanuts. You take a five meter wide uh, plot, and the length is determined by your your, the length of your field. Uh, it can be 10 meters or 100 meters. But then you have uh, uh, about five rows of peanuts. Then after five rows, then you have another five rows of maize, another row, five rows of sunflower, another five rows of another crop. So you continue doing that. And this helps in pest control and improving the soil. Where there are nuts, peanuts, soil is improved because soil Nuts are heavy givers. Where there is sunflower, uh, the soil nutrients are depleted because sunflower is a heavy feeder. It eats a lot. So when you do the alley cropping, the next season you are not planting a, a sunflower where you eat sunflower. You plant a heavy giver like beans to help supplement the nutrients that have been depleted by sunflower. So this is alley cropping system. It can be done in different forms, different crops together. So it's a choice of a farmer to practice this. But all this helps the soil, protecting the soil. When there is rain, there is no erosion that will take place on this environment. The water is forced to go into the ground. I'll talk about water later, but this is more about improving the soils. Green manure, uh, it's one of the things that we need to promote. Uh, green manure cover crops. Green manure cover crop is mainly a system that you can, anyone can practice. For example, you see this photo, there is maize and under there is the uh, cowpeas. You can practice the green manure cover crop with cowpeas, uh, blah, blah, bean, uh, Christmas bean, mainly the, the bean family and the beans that can creep or that can climb. Those are the beans that are good in cover cropping as manure. So as they grow, the most important thing that they do, they stabilize the soil, they provide the nutrients, nitrogen fixing, and when you cut them back, like before they flower, all the biomass can be pushed closer to the maize, and then your maize can grow happily because of the nutrients that it gets 
that you get from the uh, from the uh, green manure plant. So with green manure, these are some of the examples. On the left, you can see, that's my farm here, where you have a velvet bean uh, and blah, blah, with maize. And the ground there, you cannot see the ground. You cannot see the soil. The soil is covered with this crop. Then when the maize is about, you see it's about to tussle, it is the time when you slash back the, the green manure. And then when you slash it back, then it provides all the biomass, provide the nutrients or the top fertilizer uh, to the maize. Then you get your good maize. But also the green manure plants, they can help because they are good food. They provide nutrients, zinc, minerals, lots of things that can come from, uh, lots of nutrients that can come from green manure plants. Uh, green manure plants also, when you slash them back, some of them, like uh, the cowpeas and the labla bean, they can sprout again, they can grow again. So when you remove your maize, your land is not left bare. Your land is covered by the crop, by the green manure crop. And throughout winter, if you don't bring livestock in, throughout winter, the land is covered. When you are about to plant again another maize in, in, the, follow, in the following season, you just open a hole and you slash again the, the lab lab. You leave the grass, uh, the leaves on the ground, and then you open holes. Then you you plant. There is no need of bringing a tractor. There is no need of bringing a, a plow, ox plow. See, this is a system that operates naturally, and always the soil will be rich, covered, and provide a lot of uh, food diversity. So this is a great thing. On the right, also different species like in a citrus, you can grow lucerne, or you can grow a uh, country to do uh, the cover, uh, to cover the ground. So as we address nutrition uh, all the time, it is important that the ground is covered with a different kind of uh, crops, but also Trees like Moringa, see on the left here, we have Moringa. Uh, it's only we planted in rows and it can be planted in other cropping, but it is now providing shade for the farmers and at the same time providing food for the people. But also when you cut Moringa, you use the leaves to cover the ground. Then it can also provide nutrients, lots of nutrients that will be required by, by a plant, by other plants. So basically, this one it's a, a text about a green manure cover crop. Uh, why we promote it? It's more. It's a good technology that helps to provide a blanket for for the soil. It can be in winter or in summer. Soils need a blanket. Uh, we are using legumes uh, plants for soil health and fertility. This can provide lots of nutrients, quantity, lots of nutrients uh, for, for the soil, like nitrogen for the soil, and also provide biomass, and it helps in the texture and the, uh, of the topsoil. It uh, builds lots of nutrients for the soil, and it improves water holding capacity, it helps in wind break, and prevent erosion. It provides lots of nutri nutritious food for the people. A good forage, provide good forage and animal fodder for animals, for uh, wild, wildlife. Uh, it is good in controlling weeds. And these good plants, these are good plants or good system for carbon sequestration. This is about trapping carbon in the atmosphere push the carbon in the ground. And this is the only way that we can reduce carbon in the atmosphere by having plants on the landscape all the time. And uh, that helps as a tool for climate change adaptation. So what we are talking about, it can also be done in township. This is in Soweto, where we work with some farmers. 
So there are plants, you see the beans that are creeping there, but the most important thing is these beans, they cover the ground. It can also be uh, the, uh, the grapes. The grapes, it's a vine, as it uh, uh, climbs on a tree or on a, a stake, it is also covering the ground. Uh, because sunlight is not heating direct on the ground and prevents moisture, water to evaporate. So this can be done in a, a township or anywhere. It can be done on a commercial basis. So we have so many options. I wonder why we are not practicing it. So this is just uh, uh, some uh, reminder on the uh, the principles of soil conservation. Cover the soil. Soil should be covered all the time. Adoption of uh, absorption, sorry, absorption of uh, water is uh, very important. That you need to see if water is going to the ground. Do not allow water to run on the surface. Uh, protect and preserve uh, soil. And uh, once you do that, erosion is no more there. Pollution is controlled. Feed the soil all the time. We feed with organic matter. I'll show you some pictures of uh, the soils that are fed and how it produces. And then reduce pollution by taking all waste paper, uh, blankets, old blankets, anything that decompose, and uh, put it in a trench bed or in a pit bed, produce food. So when we are talking about this, it is a way that you can produce the size of pumpkin you like. That's my sister holding an 18 kg pumpkin here. And here, is, you see the leaf of uh, spinach, it can be closer to a meter because of the organic matter. You can see much there because of the organic matter that is being used in the garden. Because of building soil, uh, microbes in the soil can be multiplied and to support the crops. And all different uh, approaches can be used, can use uh, biofertilizers uh, to feed the crops. You can use dry and green leaves to feed the plants. All these can provide lots of nutrients into the soil. You can use wood ash, almond manure, kitchen waste, sweepings, as long as uh, the materials are organic, return them to the soil. And that helps in the waste management of uh, resources within where we are. So soil management checklist, just need to give you a little checklist of uh, soil management. Make sure that you understand what is a feeder. Do not mix a feeder and, and uh, a feeder and a feeder in the same field because they will uh, take lots of nutrients like tomatoes, cabbages, spinach, pumpkin, do not mix them together. You need to know which ones are light, light feeders. Onion, leeks, garlic, some herbs, parsley, celery, some of them, they are very light feeders. But you need to know also what are herb givers. You need to have plants that gives into the soil. For what are they? All legumes. Most legumes, they are herb feeders. Uh, you know them, legumes, bean family, uh, and the, you grow it, it gives through the roots or it gives through the its leaves, the biomass. The herbaceous plants, what are the herbaceous plants, which is the herbs, the parsley, strawberries, celery, turmeric, how do you grow them? And fruit trees, nuts and berries, which species do need uh, good nutrients? Then you check which ones can be uh, planted in a way that it has it access lots of food uh, from the soil. You need to know fruit trees that are nuts and berries. Okay, I talked about that. We need to know about vines. The vines are grapes, kiwi, passion fruits, shushu. These are vines that you can also integrate in the field so that you they can provide a little bit shade to protect the soil. And all these, they, are, they don't take much nutrients in the soil. So when you have this, you can also practice crop protection. Uh, out of knowing which species can be planted when and how, and uh, does it provide nutrients? <laughs> so as we talk about uh, the soil, you could have 
your fertilizer company. This is our fertilizer company, Midran. Uh, we are producing lots of compost for our, our farm. Any waste that comes out from the farm or within the plot, we use it, we turn it into compost. So this is part of our compost area. And when you have compost, it means you are bringing earthworm farms. Uh, you are bringing earthworms into the practice. As you see, I'm uh, sharing with students the earthworms that we have here, and they are working for us. These are the miners for nutrients, and they are free flowers uh, for our soils. And as you have the organic matter, you can be able to grow mushrooms because mushrooms are good in our soil. Naturally, fungus, they provide the mycelium that helps to um, activate microbes in the soil. So it is important to consider that. The compost, you can have different type of compost. For example, you can have small compost like this one, a bean compost, or this one, or just a plastic compost. You can buy the mini uh, hardwares in South Africa, but sometimes it's cheaper to build your own uh, with the plants, and that helps a lot to know that uh, we can make compost uh, on our own. So, Pit beds are a way of trapping um, water, but you dig a pit, this is the pit, and then you fill it with organic matter. You plant a tree on the side. The tree will send its roots there. Because this one is full of organic matter, your old blankets and other stuff, they are here, they can hold water, and at the same time they will decompose and then provide nutrients to the plants. So it is easy to do that, and it's applicable. Green manure is all the plants that can be grown. These are lucerne, beans, uh, sun hemp, uh, moringa. You can cut them back, grow and cut them back and support the soil. So covering soil, you can see on the left, it's another way of covering the soil. You can see uh, ladies, bees putting dry grass here on the between the drip lines. This dry grass is called dead mulch. So it's a mulch, or it's called a dry mulch. It's a mulch that will decompose and provide manure in a long life. On the right, it's wet mulch, where you can use the green manure, cover crop, sweet potatoes, pumpkin, it's just a wet mulch to cover the ground. And you can see it's the same place. Uh, after crop rotation, you can practice. You can see the our house is here, and also the our house is here. So it is the same area where we do it. first year we grow onions, and after that we grow sweet potatoes. But we make sure that the soil is covered either with dry matter or with made wet matter. And when you design your garden, make sure that uh, the soil is uh, maintained and uh, it's not allowing water to take or to, to, to erode the soil. So as you see here, it's designed with some farmers here. So because of, we follow the condor when we are making beds. So by making uh, this pathway along the condor, it will help to trap the water. It goes water into the ground. And when it happens, it fertilizes this area. So this was first um, when we designed the garden. After two months, three months, the garden was like this onto the right. It's only when you manage the soil better. Also here, uh, we changed the, this site. Uh, it's at a school in Pretoria. So the land was degraded, stones and everything. And after three months, the community members were able to have vegetables for the kids. At a school, this, was, this is a school, we work on it. And after uh, three months, you can see the ground is covered. Uh, and the, the design is determined by what you want to see on the ground to make sure that we have sustainable consumption. Yeah. So at the end, in a small land, you can produce enough pumpkin that you can sell. You can also have the sweet potatoes with organic matter 
grown with organic matter or compost the size of your head. So it's possible. So everything is possible. So what we need to know uh, is that soil is um, and water are twin sisters. So the next uh, discussion is going to be about uh, water. But uh, as the FAO indicated that 24 billion tons of fertile uh, soil or 12 million hectares topsoil are lost every year. 25% of the Earth's surface has already become degraded. And all this, uh, it's a crisis. And this crisis is leading to water, especially to water crisis, because when you lose the soil, there is no bank for holding the water. So when you lose the um, soil, there are no microbes in the soil. So how can we work it out that uh, we can uh, practice a good thing on the uh, on our farms. It's all those practices that I shared with you. And there are other more that I didn't talk about to make sure that soil is protected so that we do not have a crisis. But these crises are exacerbated by, sometimes I can say we government or government policies or representatives from the government who are not taking some of the work we are doing seriously. They tend to understand the externals, people from outside. And also corruption is there. In Africa, we have corruption in government systems and even private systems. We also have, uh, we also have uh, mismanagement of uh, resources. Uh, when you talk of uh, this mismanagement is leading to uh, mainly to injustice of uh, resources. You may have a, a good soil in, a, in an area, but you find out that he, that good soil is used now for building houses. Whilst he, uh, people are given land where it's rocky and where they cannot grow, uh, good, uh, cannot grow vegetables, or they work hard to build up the soil. So it is something that we need to be addressed. The land issue, like here in South Africa, land issue in this whole Sadak region, it's a, a, a thing that needs to be discussed, especially with communal farmers or small scale farmers. Because I have seen that they are plowing or trying to grow crops in rock areas, very sandy areas, the soils are very poor. But there are good soils closer, urban areas that they are occupied now by settlements or by houses or developments that are happening there. We also have a poor long-term investments in what we, we uh, in, um, in the government uh, sectors. Uh, they don't look at how they can invest in uh, uh, long-term projects for sustainable and for encouraging uh, local consumption. Uh, and the poor and non broad landscape planning and design. Usually, it's individuals who have interest in growing food uh, on their farm, then they practice whatever they want. There is no like uh, community design that we can be applied to make sure that water is managed, uh, not water, but soil is managed. Uh, as I say, water and soil is a twin sister. So when I talk of water, and uh, it's also uh, water. When I talk of water, also soil is affected. So we need to have a broader design for managing both water and soil on a landscape in a community, in a township, or the whole province, if possible. So basically, we are saying it's important to make sure that our soils are covered so that we produce what we want on the landscape. So to produce more, and locally, we need to make sure that soils are protected. If we cannot protect the soil, if you cannot build good soil, health soil, we won't be able to consume locally. We will depend from external importing food, importing chickens, importing um, onion, importing number of food, food basic food, basic food. So by doing that, it means we are not caring of the environment. So to care for the environment, let's cover our soils 
and feed the soil with good, with good nutrients. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, John, for the presentation. Now we need to go into discussions for those who might have questions. Please get your questions ready. Um, I noticed there are some people who have been making use of the chat box a lot. Um, so we would want to also respond to all the issues that have been raised there. And now, uh, before we get to that point, I see hands that are already up. I take note of our patients as well as our Sunday, but I'll start off with our patients. Please go ahead and um, ask your question. Um, good morning, John. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so the question that I actually have in mind is, um, I pretty much grew up on, um, on a farm. So we also had like a little farm in our backyard. So what I realized is we tend to use wastewater on to grow crops. Could that be a good practice for farming or that could actually damage and destroy the crops? And when, I, um, when I'm referring to wastewater, I'm referring to water that is left over from uh, bathing or from dishwashing. And yes, so I just wanted to find out if using such water is good for crops or if it could actually kill and damage crops. Thank you, over to you, John. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to say to introduce uh, myself where I am right now. I'm in Malawi with the SFHC organization. Uh, we have about uh, 15 members, farmers, and the, the leaders of the organization. It is, uh, uh, thank you, I can say thank you very much for accepting us to, to listen to the whole program. But answering to this question, uh, uh, the next episode is going to be talking about water. So I will cover that in the next, next expo, uh, 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 next day next training and the, on the next training uh, we'll cover a lot about gray water black water and clean water but uh, uh, answering again in short we are saying the situation of uh, gray water it has to be treated before you use it in the garden because otherwise it can cause uh, pollution in the to the plants thank you Thank you very much, John, for that. Um, in the chat box, we have a question that is coming. There are three questions that have been uh, put together from Mark Jr. He says, how best can we analyze soil without any equipment to use in the process? That is the first question. The second question is, is sheet mulching not harmful to microorganisms? And um, Number three, where could we get rab rab? Not sure about the spelling rab rab seeds because it's spelled it as R A B R A B. So those are the three questions. Maybe if you can respond to those, then I'll come to a Sunday. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are promoting, I will start with the last one, the lab lab. We are promoting lab lab um, seed all over Southern Africa. Uh, as I say, I'm in Malawi. We are distributing some lab lab from our office uh, to Malawi and the Malawi people are growing it. In Zimbabwe, uh, we have some farmers who are growing it. In South Africa, if you visit me in Midrand, I am growing lab lab and we have the lab lab in store, which we can share. Um, lab lab, we have three varieties of lab lab the white variety, the brown variety, and the black variety. Both, they work the same, they work the same in green manure cover crop. But also in green manure cover crop, you can use lima bean. We also stock lima bean. We can also use um, what you call the, uh, in Malawi, they call it karongonda, which is the velvet bean, which you can use also for green manure cover crop. 
Also for green manure, you can use cow peas and other uh, legumes for green manure purposes. The other question, sheet mulching. Sheet mulching, it's a, uh, not harmful to microorganisms. You know what happens usually is the, when you cover a card box, if you take a card box and put it outside in on a lawn, Uh, so it yeah, helps for... actually in feeding, in feeding the the soil with food. So it's not harmful to microorganisms. It is, helps the microorganism to activate. You are actually giving an umbrella to the microorganism from uh, the scorching sun. Uh, about analyzing without equipment, yeah. You remember in Southern Africa we have so many farmers, small scale farmers. It will be very much. Uh, appropriate to, to assist uh, local farmers with the, uh, an appropriate way of analyzing soil without equipment. We have research stations that are there, agricultural research stations or universities, but how much are they uh, doing to support the community? And when you test, uh, take the soil for We've lost you a bit, John. Hello? Hello, John, we can't get you now. May you please um, take off your video? The labs, you find that it's expensive for checking uh, if Oh, yes, John, if you may take off uh, your video so that we can hear you. you. We couldn't hear the last part of the answer when you were saying taking the soil to um, the labs and so on. We didn't get that part very well. If you may repeat. Okay, thank you very much. Um, basically what we are saying, if you take soil to the um, research station, or to the uh, university, it might be very expensive to, to do soil analysis there. And you know, farmers, they do not have resources to pay for the, the soil uh, analysis. So usually we try to have appropriate way of uh, uh, making farmers understand how they can test the soil. Basically to understand the, uh, the type of soil what's in the soil, like in the general minerals that are found in the soil and the acidic of the soil. So it is a, a method that you can do without much apparatus, without much materials or, yeah. Thank you very much. We'll go to Asande, then we can go back to some of the questions that are on the chat. Uh, Asande, please go ahead and um, ask your question. All right, thank you, Gabriel, for giving me this opportunity. I have two questions for John. Uh, but firstly, I would like to applaud him for his wonderful presentation. Uh, my you. questions are on uh, station planting. I didn't get you well on station planting, so if you could please repeat so that I can get it. Uh, um, the second question is on um, standard bed. You also mentioned that as one way that improves the soil. So I cannot understand how making standard plates uh, can help improve the soil. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Asande. Um, the, the station planting, uh, it is where you, you, you go into the field, like in this time of the year, especially in September or August, you go into the field and mark you put lines where you want to grow maize, for example. Uh, then you dig a, a, a small pit, which is 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter by 15 centimeter deep. You fill that with organic matter, and then you leave it until you receive rain. When you receive rain, water, rain is going to be trapped into to that pit. Or, and then when it's trapped there, then it, it keeps moisture. Then you come with your seed, you plant it there. 
it's a station planting. You don't need to plow the whole field, but you just make small pits in the garden, in the field, and then use that. That can be done in small, at a smaller scale farming. Even the standard bed, it can also be done at a smaller scale. The standard bed, it's in a vegetable bed, which is 1.2 meters wide. And the length can be determined by yeah, the size of your garden. It can be 10 meters or it can be 15 meters length. Then you fill it, the, the, you, you shape the bed on the edge to make sure that you, you, you create a pathway around it. The pathway should be about four centimeters. Then when you set that, you fill the inner part of the bed with compost, a thick layer, maybe a bucket of compost, a 20 liter bucket of compost for two square meters. You cover the whole field, the whole bed. And then you dig in the compost. After digging in the compost, you put mulch. After mulch, you, you plant. Um, that symbol is that a standard bed. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for answering those questions. And I noticed the other question was already in the chat. So that is um, covered. Um, questions, your hand is still up. Is that another question or is um, for the previous question? Um, apologies, the hand was up from the previous question. Okay, thank you. Um, now we would want to move on. We have um, Numisa, but um, after you have uh, asked your question, Numisa would also want to go to the Mentimeter so that we can actually have everybody responding. You can go ahead, Numisa. Um, sorry, Gabriel, I don't have a question, but I do want to note to people that I will be putting in a Mentimeter link just before we close this meeting for people that have further questions for John Zera. And then that um, those questions will be sent. I see people are also asking about presentations. When we're done with this work, all of the workshops, we will send all the recordings to everyone and the question and answer document will have all the answers. So before the end of the meeting, we will send another Mentimeter link for everyone who has more questions or further questions to what we've had so far to ask John and it will be part of the post communications package. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Numisa. So we're going to put in the um, chat a link for the Mentimeter, then you may uh, go ahead and uh, present and um, answer that so that we could also all participate and see how much uh, progress we are making on these um, presentations that um, Ms. Jinzira is giving to us. And um, I note a, a question, which is also in a form of a comment that last week, yes, I said we were going to be sending this, but it was uh, noted that it would be better if we can put all the, all the um, slides together, as uh, Nunes has said, then we'll, all, we'll just send them all at once. So please just hang on and hold on and hold on. Then we will be able to share with you everything because this is meant to help you now and also in the future as you are um, going through. Then um, I notice um, Reverend Thomas, you were asking bread basket of the world. Um, I'm not sure. Okay, you were saying with such wonderful ideas and technical skills in agroecology, what is hindering Southern Africa from establishing itself as a permanent uh, breadbasket of the world? Okay, um, as uh, Mr. Nzira said, I think he answered that partly to say, um, part of um, the problem really sits with the policymakers because at the moment we have very few countries that have actually taken up agroecology as a way to go in terms of um, farming, you find that most of the policies refer to commercial farming, which is um, the one that uses um, chemical fertilizers and chemicals for, and pesticides 
And one which we are saying, maybe from a services point of view, we are saying it is um, not environmentally friendly. So we actually encourage people to go into agroecology as compared to using the heavy chemical um, use in terms of um, fertilizers and pesticides, which are not environmentally friendly. Um, I see another end from um, Ayodeji. He had asked a question in the chat to say he didn't get much as far as um, testing the soil without use of um, the labs and um, chemicals. I think that was the time when it was breaking. So John, if you may actually want to respond to Ayodeji's question, if um, maybe still as a follow on, I'll give you time Ayodeji after John has um, gone back and uh, answered the same question on the use of um, the testing the soil without the use of chemicals. John. Uh, uh, yeah. Gabriel, can you repeat the question, please? The question was, how can we test the soil without using uh, chemicals or the labs? I think you were answering it, but that was the time when there was um, some bit of breakup. Oh, OK, OK. I was saying that um, uh, it is possible to test the soil without the chemicals or without the lab. Um, let's look at pH. The pH uh, can be measured by using the litmus paper. With litmus paper, you can get it from uh, any chemist shop or any, uh, yeah. Uh, litmus paper can be found in shops and then you take soil, you mix it with water, you shake it into the bottle, and then uh, you dip in the litmus paper. It can show you the pH of uh, the soil. This can be done by farmers because litmus paper is not expensive. You can also use just the collecting soil, put it in a bottle, it can measure the, um, the type of soil you have in the field, clay, silt or loam soil. And when you have sand, the farmers will know what I need to do is to put a lot of organic matter or compost to balance the nutrients that are required by the soil. Because we all aim to have loam soil. So it's basically simple. Any soil you have, work hard to make it loam soil. Loam soil, any crop can grow in a loam soil. So with the farmers, they need just to be uh, educated on using the resources available to make sure that they understand soil. Once they understand soil, they also understand the microbes in the soil. And once they see microbes, microorganisms in the soil, they know their soil is healthy. So it's about awareness and training that is required to the, our farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Now, Ayodej, do you have any follow-up question to that? Yes, thank you, um, Gabriel. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, John. Uh, thank you for the response to the question. The additional question I have is, in the course of the presentation, um, you did mention that um, when we have good soil, when our soil is good and very healthy, it gives us a um, good looking and healthy, healthy plants. And as a result of that, it also helps to keep pests and diseases away. But I have a little, I have a contrary opinion to that. Because these pests and diseases, they are like um, our competitors for food. That which looks healthy to us, that which, which looks luxurious to us on our plant, on our crop, it looks the same way to them. And so that's why they go out for the healthy looking crop. So I wish you can clarify that. And when we have such cases now, because to the best of my knowledge in places where we have had um, good looking crops, um, those crops, they are more, um, more prone to attack by pests and diseases. So when we have such case, um, how can we best manage the situation, keeping the, the pests and diseases below the economic threshold um, in an agroecological way? Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. Yes, you may go ahead, Mr. Anzina. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, maybe I just want to check uh, the previous speaker if he is a scientist or a farmer. If he is a farmer, you will be able to know that any health plant can resist the disease and even uh, can resist the number of challenges, pests and diseases. When a plant is growing, the health plant can resist that. But if you are a researcher, there is still a gap that probably you need to work with farmers to learn from them. They will tell you, and you can experiment that any health plants that are growing their farms, they don't usually spray. But a weak plant, a plant that doesn't have enough nutrients, it's usually easily attacked by pests. That's our experiment, that's our findings. If we ever come across red spider mites, the red spider mite, when the plant is healthy, you can see that it cannot easily attack, it cannot infest the, the plant so fast. It takes a longer time to cover the whole plant because some plants will be able to sort of resist because of the health position they are. Unless we are talking about the, the locusts, of course, if it's infestation of locusts, they'll go for health plants because that's probably the green, only the only green health plants in the area. And also, if you are talking about monoculture, one species at a time, it's easily attacked, despite even the plants are healthy because there is no other means or no other food for the insects to, to eat. But if we have created the bio, uh, the, the what go, the, uh, the, the live fence and buffer zones with the diverse species, then insects or some pests can be hindered by those species because they would not like to, to eat everything. They select certain species. So if you have strong smelling species in an area, uh, it also helps in controlling this pest. And unfortunately, we are going to talk about pest management in the next episode. So I'll go deeper into that. But for now, I'm just uh, sharing with you that healthy soil can help build healthy plants. Healthy plants can be able to resist against disease and against uh, pests in your farm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank John. You. Next, um, Thank you. we can move on to Darlington Musekiwa. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Gabriel. Thank you, John. Um, I, 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 I just want to say, uh, John, you are, is really preaching uh, to me. I've got, I've started a small demo plot here in Zimbabwe, and uh, there's a lot that I'm picking from uh, the presentations being made. Uh, but Gabriel, I just wanted to find out on our workshop uh, objectives. Uh, where you say the, uh, the, the, the participants, it's point number two, which was saying uh, support with equipment and small grants to start some, some, some agroecological uh, project. May you shed a bit more light on this one, uh, Gabriel? I'm, I'm just linking it to uh, what John is presenting and what we are trying to do back home. Thank you very much, uh, Darlington. Yes, um, in that point, objective number two, yes, we actually said would want to support um, a number of people from this call to actually go ahead and um, keep um, the agroecological practice alive or to actually start it and uh, maintain it. So for those that might have, um, their projects, what we would want you to do, we are going to, and we may not be able to have everybody being covered, but we are going to select people and the selection is um, on proportionality, meaning for, we would want to cover, as Wayne shared the other day, we would want to cover as many countries as possible so that we would have, um, almost an equal number of people benefiting from um, these small grants that we have. 
So you can actually draft your request, which should actually show what you would want to, to do, where you are located, and also indicating we are mainly interested in the land where you actually have proof that you, the piece of land you have authority to actually make use of that particular piece of land because we wouldn't want you to start off a project on a land that does not belong to you and which you may actually lose. And also it would be great if um, the land is part of um, say most of the faith um, communities or faith groups, say at a mosque, at a temple, at a church, a warm part of the community land where we can actually have um, many people having access to it. But we can also support the small old um, farmers independently. But then you would need to write us and um, indicate what your needs are. And um, also in terms of uh, the quantities that you would actually want in terms of um, the actual amounts. And then we can actually process that and see we would have a, a vetting process which would also link up with um, the other um, ongoing um, processes so that you may not actually be going from one program to the other and getting support. So this one should actually be supporting those who are applying for the first time. So thank you very much, Dan, uh, Darlington. Do we have any other questions relating to um, this issue on the presentation or the presentation that John made today? Okay, um, maybe whilst we are waiting for some of the questions, um, may I ask um, Numisa to actually share with us the Mentimeter? But I also noticed the, yes, there it comes. Let's uh, go to that link and uh, let's all participate in, the, in answering the questions that we actually got. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, just to note that there's two questions. I'm going to, when people answer the first one, they have to wait a minute so they can answer the second one as well. So I encourage everyone to respond to the main people. <clears throat> Thank you, Numisa. So let's, uh, let's get on and um, answer the question that we have in the Mentimeter. What has stood out for you in the past two sessions. What has stood out for you in the past two sessions? For those who might have, be having problems, maybe in answering the question or um, getting onto the link, possibly you may answer that also in the chat box, but we do encourage you to use the Mentimeter so that it can be easily collated. So the question is, what has stood out for you in the past two sessions? Um, we are pleading with every one of you to actually help to give us the feedback so that we are also better able to respond to your needs. We wouldn't want to just assume that all is well, but would also want you to share with us that which is um, set very well with you and um, that would only help us as we move forward. Um, we can actually go on and see. And let me say, maybe you could explain. Do we get to see the results of this first, or we would um, await the other one? Um, <clears throat> these are the results of the first question that I'm, very, I'm uh, sharing now, um, okay. Gabriel. So once we have all input our answers for this. We'll move on to the second question. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing this screen. We'll come back to showing the results so I can open the slide for the second question for those that um, are done answering the first question. Thank you very much. You can see the answers on the screen, but because uh, we would want on to move on to the second question as well, uh, we'll get back to this and then we can see what the responses are 
coming from all of us. Yes, um, let me say, you may move on to the next one. Thank you. I'm hoping that people are able to see the following question. Question two. If you're able to respond to question two, please say aye. Gabriel, are you able to see question two from the link I sent? Um, no, I haven't got. Okay, yes, I saw the link. Yes, it's coming up. Thank you. And the second question, which reads, what have you started implementing to date? Of those things that you have learned from the two sessions, what have you started implementing to date? Let's all try to respond to the questions as well. What have you started implementing to date on the things that you have um, learned? What have you started um, implementing to date? And there are some people who are saying they haven't said yet. Um, and some have, were saying they had not seen the second question, but the second question was saying, of what you have learned to date, what have you started implementing? Okay, now let's go to some of the answers. I can see a lot of answers are coming up. Thank you very much. This would help us to also design um, some of the upcoming issues and also to be able to give additional information where there might not be sufficient information or where, as Numisa said, you may have questions, we can actually be better able to address that. Um, I'm seeing that at Township Farming in Zimbabwe, I have encouraged women to do backyard gardens in the high density suburbs. And uh, some people are talking about agro forestry project so far, where they've managed to establish a nursery with uh, nutrient fixing trees such as Musangu, Cendrella, Cacacia, however, failure to get the citrus seeds. Um, we also have uh, mulching advocacy on reduced agriculture and reduced agricultural industrialization, dry mulching and adding manure and digging well as a source of water. Um, a garden has been mounted and land prepared and somebody saying I've learned and I'm feeding the soil with cow manure in preparation for the farming season. And somebody says, yes, I've prepared 20 hectares. Well, that's great. And as uh, there's somebody also is seeking good quality seeds. And um, we have people are looking for good quality seeds as well. I think we may need to also ask John to respond to this in terms of, do we have any food hubs that um, people know of or that you can recommend to people? I'll, for the seeds, I can also ask people to get in touch with um, an organization called C CDT, CDMT, which is uh, in water for Zarare. I think they do have a seed sharing um, program. So please do check with them. It's in Waterfalls Northway for those that are in Zimbabwe. So John, if you may share what are places or seed hubs that might be in existence in South Africa, in Zimbabwe or right around the region, 
where you, we do have so that people might also have access to some of the seeds. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, the, the Mentimeter will stay live. People can continue responding. We'll also make those responses for everyone else who's probably looking at what other people are doing. We'll make, we'll send them as part of package of the post communications to everyone so we can learn from each other. Thank you very much, Nimisa, for that. So what others have learned and what others have started doing we are going to be sharing so that together we can learn as a group because we also need not only learning from uh, Ms. Nzira, but we are also going to be learning from each other. And we do um, encourage that let's link up. If you realize somebody who is from the same country with you or even right across the borders, let us share information and actually give each other encouragement on the work that we are doing. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Now, is there some burning questions that we might have before we get to the closing part? Yes, Darlington. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. I just, on the seed dabs, will it be possible for, you have shared this one, seed DTC in waterfalls, is it possible to get further details for the seed, seed dabs around the, the region? If there are contact details for the seed houses, I think that would be great so that we can uh, go for, for, for it. Yes, I think um, we will also need to put that through the same communication, maybe for John to actually give us the details on where we can actually be able to go and get the, the seeds from. And um, I see that somebody is saying, no, may we please have the details for the food app. Okay, um, for those that would want the address that I had given for Arare, please do get in touch on email, then I can share that uh, with you in terms of the address at which we can actually access some of the seeds from. Then John would also add where we can actually go to as far as the region is um, sent. So we'll get back to you, Darlington, and um, we would actually share with you those areas where we can have um, the seeds from. So thank you, everyone. And we are very happy to see that we have had a consistent number of people would want to actually go ahead and learn on agroecology, please let's be all encouraged to start our gardens, even in our backyards. And um, I've heard from John that we can also even make use of um, soils for those that live in the, um, maybe um, who are using um, multi-story buildings as their accommodation. If you have um, your small veranda, you can actually bring the soil up and to plant your crops there as well. I think you will be touching on that as we proceed. John, I saw that you wanted to say something. Uh, no, 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 thank you. It's uh, uh, all about the, actually the where well, they can get seeds in, uh, in Zimbabwe and in, in the Sadak and you have actually mentioned it already. So perfect, oh. we will give them the, the contact details. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and I would want to ask uh, Blessings Jamala to uh, give us a word of prayer. But before we do that, uh, Chloe would want to take a quick photo of all of us. If we can turn our cameras on and then we can have our group photo for today. Photo. And as we are preparing, we just want to say to... John, thank you very much, John, for the wonderful presentations and the teachings that you are giving us. And uh, can we have the people from Malawi in actually standing in, if you can move your computer backwards so that we can have all the 15 of you, John, in the... Mm. Let's uh, put our cameras on so that we can take the group photo.
Hello? Yes, um, blessing. You may go ahead with the prayer. Let us pray. Uh, thank you, God, for giving us uh, uh, We also beg you to bless our presenters or give us uh, knowledge and you keep us with skills in our programs we have been doing. We really appreciate you that without you, we can't go further with our programs. We have really appreciated you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone. John, thank you very much and uh, give our appreciation to the group that was with you and everybody else on the call. Thank you very much for keeping on on this particular program. Let's meet again next week at uh, 10.30 on Monday. Uh, they have a uh, blessed uh, planting and preparation for planting. Thank you. And I'd also want to give my appreciation to the team, Numisa and uh, Chloe. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Um, Bye-bye, Gabriel. Bye.